Can you give the listeners a brief historical background on the construct of pain, the research as it's evolved up to this point, and then within that, what was the impetus to write this paper and to create this model as an extension and a progression towards our understanding of pain? Easy question, right? Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> There's not going to be any easy uh, questions today, I don't think. Oh, yeah. darn. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, See ya. It's, it's, it's Friday at 4.45 here. Um, <laughs> right. I, 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 think I, can, I, I just pulled up the paper here. Like, I can do my, uh, do my best to, like, hit on some of the main key things that we, we hit on, so the main theories over time uh, in the context of healthcare. You, you guys know this stuff well. Like, uh, I, I know you do, and so... Like after I kind of give a little brief snippet, like jump in, like and if there's anything to add, like for the, that would you think would benefit the the listeners, uh, go for it. Um, but I guess where we started with the paper was with Rene Descartes in the in the 17th century, which is like pretty standard. Uh, people people know Descartes; he's a philosopher, uh, very very influential um, in terms of all different types of realms, even even outside of pain. And essentially what he, we discussed, he proposed initially on was that tissue damage was directly proportional to pain. Um, so a very kind of mechanical perspective on pain. And he also had this concept of dualism. So the idea that there was this uh, material body that somehow interacted with this immaterial mind or, or immaterial soul. Um, and, uh, Really, that those ideas, that mechanical perspective, and also that dualist perspective has endured to this day when we start to talk about pain. So very mechanical perspectives. Um, and if we can't find something very mechanical, we'll often say, oh, it's it's in the mind or it's it's psychosocial or psychological. So that was kind of where we really started off in the paper. Um, anything that you guys have to add in terms of Descartes and his influence? No, I think that's the struggle, though, because I, it's like you said, it's still prominent in a lot of the teachings. And as I'm sure that you guys will allude to, as you as you move through the the science of pain, we we tend to fall back into that trap, even though the model progresses in construct and in theory, we tend to reduce it because it's easier to make sense of the world that way when we compartmentalize well and and the other bit is and that's absolutely right and the other thing is that a lot of the pain presentation that we encounter in the clinical setting fits that model you know uh acute pain you you can find some tissue that's sensitive and it's uh, aligns with the you know the amount of damage aligns with the kind of experience the person is having so that it's it it's based on you know observational science Descartes that's what he did and there's a lot of truth to it and that's why it, it's it's so persistent I think it's just that it's not that simple <laughs> and uh, and so we have uh, as Peter will say you know this lovely evolution of people just trying to uh, make sense of the parts that are harder to understand. And how has that evolution kind of taken shape now? I mean, where do we go from Descartes to, to where we are now? Yeah, so in the paper, we, we then jump to the 19th century, and we talk about how there's really been still an endorsement of a kind of a linear, linear relationship between noxious stimuli and pain. So we reference a couple different theories, so specificity theory, intensity theory, pattern theory, and these are all still very kind of mechanical, physiological explanations for sensory input going up and the brain passively uh, having an output of pain. And uh, unfortunately, like during this time, patients were stigmatized if, if they couldn't find some sort of physical cause or there wasn't some sort of obvious noxious stimuli. Um, patients were sent to psychiatrists or they were viewed as psychologically disturbed uh, and, and, and really challenging for those people suffering from persistent pain that didn't have some sort of obvious uh, noxious stimuli attached to it that would drive no susception. Kind of within that, the evolution of this biopsychosocial model where we start to account for these things or at least acknowledge that they exist 
Mm-hmm. Where would you say that's that started? At what point in this in this timeline, and, and who was spearheading that concept? Yeah, so I guess from I'm, I'm looking at the paper where we kind of approached it. So we. I guess we went up to 1965 with Melzac and Wall. So this was a really kind of pinnacle point where they proposed that gate control theory, which I know you guys are, are well aware of. It's commonly taught in, in different schools, uh, regardless of the rehab profession, so physiotherapy, chiropractic, medicine. You'll hear that all the time. And what was really interesting about their 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 theory was that there was actually modulation uh, or, or gating of nociception at the spinal cord. And also they suggested that the brain actually has an influence as well. It's not just a, a, a passive organ. It actually can exert these anti-nociceptive uh, effects or that top-down inhibition. So it really started to explain these unusual situations uh, where, where nociception has been modulated, right? And I... It, it wasn't until night to get to your question. It wasn't until the '60s, still, I guess, around that time, and then 1977, that pinnacle paper that George Engel published. But around that same time, that's where the biopsychosocial model started to develop. Um, but as as we'll discuss, it's it's not until very recently that it's really been picked up uh, in the context of, say, physiotherapy. Um, even though it's been around since the, the 60s and more formally 1977. I think it's important to create this this narrative in the timeline, you know, the understand the construct of the history of this. I can say that this a lot of the, the students now compared to even, you know, I've only been out for six years, but I think the, the understanding of pain has broadened and improved and I think the curriculum has gotten better and I think students are talking uh, talking about this model this biopsychosocial model more and I would say in our biased community we that's generally the standard that we use to understand the construct of pain 